All right, Jason, thank you. Good morning, guys. Good to see you bright and early and awake. Coffee is the gift of God that wakes us up. But uh, I'm glad you're here. We're, uh, we are Forge, a place where God builds men in strength and truth. And uh, we're a group of men of all ages uh, that will gather together in this time. So I'm glad you're here. Now, I want you to know that this week and next week, we are in a mini-series on marriage. At two weeks, uh, we're following up our fathering series uh, in this whole issue of marriage. And uh, we're, we're doing that because, because we have this whole issue and whole range of, of what we do as men. You know, here at Forge, we talk a lot about our core identity. Let me ask you, does anybody remember what our core identity is as we talk about that here at Forge? We are... Sons, all right, right up here. We are sons of the Most High God. That is our core identity. We've gone over that over and over and over, and that is something that will never change throughout every phase of your life. Now, we've got a lot of other core roles, don't we? We're leaders in our families. We're, we're fathers. We're husbands. Uh, we're also worker providers. Those roles are important. We're also warriors in some respects. We'll talk more about that in the future. And so uh, we're talking about marriage because it's following up the fathering series. Um, but marriage is leading in our marriage is one of our core roles. It's really, really important. Now, let me give you a truth here about, about this whole idea of, uh, of talking about marriage, and that is this. The quality of our marriage, are you listening, determines the outcome of our fathering. It got real quiet in here. The quality of our marriage determines the outcomes of our fathering. And so that's one reason why we're following up a series on fathering with a series on marriage because it's very important for us to understand the reality that what we do in marriage affects how we raise those kids. Uh, and so we're, all, but we're, but for guilt's sake, we're only doing two weeks on marriage. I don't know if we can handle more than two weeks in a row. Um, now, just as we talked about fathering, there's two major uh, fears that I have and that every man has when we're talking about these subjects, father and marriage. Number one, you won't think this applies to you. Uh, and, 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 and so some of you are saying, ah, oh, I shouldn't have come. This was the day to sleep in. It's on marriage. Listen, I'm not married or I'm doing really well in marriage or I'm divorced. I don't want to deal with that. Uh, and, and so the reason why we're talking about it, remember we here at Forge talk about the full orbed men's curriculum. And so we have got the constant, we deal with all things men and the Bible here at Forge. And we have constantly got to be sharpened in our interaction uh, on all these topics so we can be ready to help other guys, not just ourselves. Right? And the second fear that we have about uh, uh, talking about this is just that you ever talk about marriage, the, the guilt level in the room just goes up. Uh, guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. And... Um, some of you are saying, I failed so bad in marriage, I can't tell you. Listen, one of the things we, we are about at Forge is, is how grace energizes growth. That's what we're about. Uh, and so all good growth, all real growth, all lasting growth and development in a man's life comes from the grace of God in Jesus Christ, right? So we always start with the gospel. Have you, how many of you, how many of you are married or have been married? Raise your hands, all right? All right. How many of you have ever made a mistake in marriage? Raise your hand. Same hands went up. I mean, there's nobody perfect around you. If you didn't raise your hand and you're married, you lie about other things, for crying out loud. So at the foot of the cross is grace, and at the foot of the cross is a no-guilt zone. This is a no-guilt zone because of grace. I thought maybe our, our guy put up something there that uh, uh, Scott is wont to do and maybe surprised me a little bit. You were all laughing up there. Uh, but, but the reality is we've all made mistakes and, and, and therefore the gospel sets us free. Now after this series, we're going to do a series in Mark. Two weeks in marriage and a longer series in the gospel of Mark. You're going to love him. He's one of my mentors. He was mentored by the apostle Peter 
And so he's got a lot to tell us about Jesus. All right, today for the very first time, what I want to do is I want to give you, at the very outset of a, of a talk on marriage, is I want to give you the definitive, the unchanging clarity about the difference between a man and a woman. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you before, but this is something that you will thank me for. It's deep. It's profound. It's meaningful. <laughs> One of the things we need to know as men is the difference between men and women. And today, here, you're going to get it. Let's say a guy named Roger is attracted to a woman named Elaine. He asks her out to a movie. She accepts and they have a pretty good time. A few nights later, he asks her out to dinner and again, they enjoy themselves. They continue to see each other regularly. And after a while, neither one of them is seeing anyone else. And then one evening when they're driving home, a thought occurs to Elaine and without really thinking, she says it aloud. Do you realize that as of tonight, we've been seeing each other for exactly six months and there's silence in the car. To Elaine, it seems like a very loud silence. She thinks to herself, gee, I wonder if it bothers him that I said that. Maybe he's been feeling confined by our relationship. Maybe he thinks I'm trying to push him into some kind of obligation he doesn't want or isn't sure of. And Roger's thinking, gosh, six months. And Elaine is thinking, but hey, I'm not sure I want this kind of relationship either. Sometimes I wish I had a little more space so I'd have time to think ab about what I'd really want to keep going the way we're going or moving steadily forward? I mean, where are we going? Are we just going to keep seeing each other at this level of intimacy? Are we headed toward marriage, toward children, toward a lifetime together? And am I ready for that level of commitment? Do I even really know this person? And Roger's thinking, so that means it was, let's see, February when we started going out. <laughs> Which was right after I had the car at the dealer's, which means let me check the odometer. Whoa, I'm way overdue for an oil change here. <laughs> and Elaine is thinking, he's upset. I can see it on his face. Maybe I'm reading this completely wrong. Maybe he wants more from our relationship, more intimacy, more commitment. Maybe he has sensed, even before I sensed it, that I was feeling some reservations. I bet that's it. That's why he's so reluctant to say anything about his own feelings. He's afraid of being rejected. And Roger's thinking, and I'm going to have to have them look at that transmission again. I, I don't care what those morons say. It's still not shifting right. And they better not try to blame it on the cold weather this time. What cold weather? It's 87 degrees. And this thing's shifting like a garbage truck. I paid those incompetent thieves 600 bucks. And Elaine is thinking, he's angry. <laughs> And I don't really blame him. I'd be angry too. I feel so guilty putting him through this. But I can't help the way I feel. I'm just not sure. And Roger's thinking, they'll probably say it's only a 90-day warranty, those scumballs. <laughs> and Elaine is thinking, maybe I'm just too idealistic, waiting for a knight to come riding up on a white horse when I'm sitting right next to a perfectly good person, a person I enjoy being with, a person I truly do care about, a person who seems to truly care about me, a person who's in pain because of my self-centered, schoolgirl, romantic fantasy. And Roger's thinking, warranty? They want a warranty? I'll give them a warranty. I'll take that warranty and stick it there. Roger, Elaine says out loud, what? Says Roger, startled. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't torture yourself like this, she says, her eyes beginning to fill with tears. Maybe I should never have, oh, I feel so. She breaks down sobbing. <laughs> Roger says, what? I'm such a fool, Elaine sobs. I mean, I know there's no night. I really know that. It's silly. There's no night and there's no horse. <laughs> You think I'm a fool, don't you, Elaine says. No, says Roger. <laughs> Finally glad to have a correct answer. <laughs> it's just that I need some time, Elaine says. There's a 15 second pause while Roger, thinking as fast as he can, tries to come up with a safe response. Finally comes up with one that he thinks might work. Yes, he says. Elaine, deeply moved, touches his hand. Oh, Roger. 
do you really feel that way? What way? <laughs> that way about time, says Elaine. Oh, says Roger, yes. Elaine turns to face him and gazes deeply into his eyes, causing him to become very nervous about what she might say next, especially if it involves a horse. Um, <laughs> at last, she speaks. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, says Roger. <laughs> then he takes her home and she lies on her bed, a conflicted, tortured soul, and weeps until dawn. When Roger gets back to his place, he opens a bag of Doritos, turns on the TV, and immediately becomes deeply involved in a rerun of a tennis match between two Czechoslovakians he's never heard of. <laughs> a tiny voice in the rear excesses of his mind tells him that something major was going on back there in the car, but he was pretty sure there's no way he'd ever understand what, and so he figures it's better if he doesn't think about it. <laughs> the next day, Elaine calls her close friend, perhaps two of them, and they will talk about this situation for six straight hours. In painstaking detail, they will analyze everything she said and everything he said, going over it time and again, exploring every word, expression, and gesture for nuances of meaning, considering every possible ramification. They'll continue to discuss this subject on and off for weeks, maybe months, never reaching any definite conclusions, but never getting bored with it either. Meanwhile, Roger, while playing racquetball one day with a mutual friend of his and Elaine's, will pause just before serving, frown, and say, Norm, did Elaine ever own a horse? <laughs> and that's the difference between a man and a woman, huh? <laughs> you heard it here, and now you know. You know, it's good to laugh when we deal with the relationships with the opposite sex because they're so challenging. Uh, and, and, and we got to laugh and we got to laugh at ourselves. Uh, and as we get a little bit more serious and talk about marriage, uh, we have to ask the question, what is marriage about? What is marriage all about? Remember with the fathering series, we asked the question, what does a father do? I'm going to go out on a, line, a limb here and ask if anybody remembers, what does a father do? A father is, oh, I'm going to answer it because I, I don't trust you guys. That was, that was like, what, two weeks ago? A father is building a life, right? A, a father is a life builder. And so we, we really need to have a simple uh, understanding of what marriage is too. What is marriage? We have to have a simple biblical understanding of what marriage is because frankly I need I need the summation I don't get a lot of complexity and the summation of marriage is this marriage in, in a nutshell is illustrating Christ okay if fathering is building a life marriage in its core at its basis is illustrating Christ. Now, I can, I'm going to unpack that and I'm going to explain that to you, but I want to ask, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this one, but how many of us really understood when we went into marriage what marriage really was about? We had some ideas about marriage, didn't we? We had some thoughts about what marriage would be. Of course, in a man's mind, the three S's are the big deal in life. <coughs> Significance, success, and sex, and not necessarily in that order. But those things tend to dominate our minds. And so when we're young and we move into marriage, we don't really have a clarity of an understanding of what marriage is. Uh, and, and so we got to get that right from the beginning. Let me read to you some text in Ephesians. I'm going to jump down to Ephesians 5. If you have your Bibles, 5, 22 through 33. Um, it starts out with this. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you moving it down there. Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. My favorite book in the entire Bible, Wives, Submit to Your Own Husbands as to the Lord. Uh, now, <laughs> I don't even need to ask, can I get a witness on that? <laughs> this is the man's verse, you know. I, I love this. I love this verse because, but it's in the context of mutual submission. And so we have to unpack that. Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. And that's, that's important, isn't it? But what, what, what has been misused down through biblical history is this idea 
this thought that all the men were to get all the women to submit to all of them. That's not what this is saying, is it? It's in the imperative, and that means that it's a command to women, not a command to men. Did you guys hear that? This is not addressed to you. The wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. In other words, in other words, it's not a command that you take home and say, my job is to make you to submit. And that's where it's been misused greatly down through the history of the church. The text goes on. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is himself its savior. Uh, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And some of you have underlined in everything like 40 times in, in your Bible. You know, the, it's interesting here as you back up in, in, into verse 23 when it says that the husband is the head of the wife. In the original Greek, the word head is kephale. Now, how does that word kephale, is, how is it to be interpreted? There's two major interpretations out there. One, head means Headship, which means leadership, which means authority. The head on the body directs the body, doesn't it? It has authority over the body. And so one interpretation is that. Another interpretation is that the word kephale or head means source of life. Now, let me ask you this, guys. In a very real sense, isn't the head of the body not only the authority over the body, but the source of life for the rest of the body? Yeah, it is. Are both of those meanings biblical? Yes. But what some interpreters try to say about the word kephale and headship is they try to say, yeah, kephale means source of life, but it doesn't have any authority involved in it. And that's why Wayne Grudem did a study on the word kephale in the whole first century, and he realized that in all of its uses, it carries this, both ideas, but it carries the idea of authority. And, and to take authority out of it <coughs> strips away the manhood leadership role that we have. And so wives are to recognize that. I'm not to necessarily make my wife recognize it. That's the difference. But I do have leadership authority in my family, and you do too. So that's why submiss submission. Now, he gets to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're all members of his body. Therefore, quoting Genesis, a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. From that text, we get this clear teaching that marriage at its core is illustrating Christ. He goes on and on about marriage, but then he says, wait a minute. The key thing here is how Christ views his church. So a marriage ought to be illustrative of how Jesus Christ came to the earth, loved his bride, the church, sacrificed for it, died for it, rose again for it, nurtures it, leads it. Marriage at its core is illustrative of Jesus Christ's work on the cross. Now, when Paul says... Uh, this mystery is great. How many would agree that this mystery is great? Yeah. I, uh, you know, Tim Keller said in, in his book on marriage, marriage is glorious but hard. He has got a firm grasp of the obvious. I love how he puts it. it it's so true. Uh, now, in, in the whole idea of a mystery, it's kind of like you hear, how many times have I heard it in marital counseling? I don't understand him. 
And she says, and I don't, I don't, I don't understand him, and I don't understand her. It goes on and on and on. But let me give you a couple of marriage stats here. In 1960, 72% of all Americans were married. In the year 2008, only 50% of Americans were married. Marriage is declining somewhat in America. In 1970, 89% of all children in America were born to couples. In 2016, only 60%. Is marriage a good thing, guys? Boy, some of you went right away on that. And then there was some noticeable silence out there. It's interesting that, uh, that, that really the statistics show that you'll be healthier if you're, if you're married. Uh, you'll live longer. 45% of all marriages end in divorce. That's true. But you know what's interesting to note about that? And you young guys got to listen to this. 45% um, of marriages end in divorce, but the greatest number of them, of those marriages that end in divorce, they were married before 18 or they, uh, yeah, they married before 18, they dropped out of high school, and they had a baby together before marrying. Those have the highest increases in divorce. Those who wait a little bit longer, uh, get some training, and move into life a little bit later together, tend to, tend to stay together. The economic benefits of marriage are great. Still, Stanley Hauerwas and Tim Keller both say um, there's no perfectly compatible mate and Keller always says that this, I love this, he says, we always end up marrying the wrong person. We do, why? Because there's no perfect person out there. Including ourselves. Everyone is incompatible because everyone is a sinner and that leads to the mystery of this thing uh, called marriage. By the way, this, Friday, this Saturday I'm speaking at Rich's church to the women. Wow. I am going to let them have it. I want you to know. It is going to be. Do you guys know that Mother's Day is Sunday? Yeah. You know that? Some of you are going, oh, shoot. You owe me. Sunday is Mother's Day. Saturday, they're having a special dinner for the ladies at New Life Church, and I get to go speak to them, tell them how important you men are. And how much we appreciate them. Rich, don't panic, buddy. I'm not going to let you down. Well, you know, one of the things I love to talk about is what I call the myth of male simplicity. You've heard me talk about this before. There is this myth that bounces around in our minds, and it is this. Women are complex, and we are simple. And it's a lie. We are very complex. You guys are every bit as complex as they are. And, uh, and, and, and the reality is, is that's what makes marriage come. Because marriage is the combination of two broken people. Even if they're redeemed, uh, we're still sinner saints in need of the glory of God. That's what leads to the mystery of marriage. How do we make this thing work? But in essence, I want you to know that in the Bible, the word mystery, musterion, literally means not something difficult to understand, like marriage. The word mysterion in the Greek is a word that means something that was formerly hidden but is now revealed. And so when he talks about what marriage is, he says, you guys didn't understand this before, but now I, the Apostle Paul, I'm helping you understand it, is that marriage at its core illustrates the relationship between Christ and his church, his bride. Listen, if you're a pagan, I, I say stay in your marriage. It's, you're gonna be, it's gonna be better for you if you can stay in it. But if you're a Christian, you gotta stay in it if you can. Marriages fail yeah, among Christians and non-Christians too. And there's there's forgiveness for that. Don't think it's the unpardonable sin. But what's the urgency for a Christian to stay in a marriage, if at all possible? Because of what it illustrates. It illustrates Christ. There are, times, there are times when Karen thought, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he's a pastor. And other people think he's spiritual. But he doesn't seem very spiritual right now. <laughs> I don't know if I want to stay in this thing. But we got these kids. He is a pastor. It would look bad. <laughs> there were times I thought, she's not a perfect woman. But it would look bad to Jesus. 
What's the great secret, uh, uh, great mystery of marriage? This mystery is profound, but I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. And so Jesus gave himself up for us and, and unified with us. In his sacrifice, great things happen, right? When you sacrifice, great things happen. Um, uh, and, and that's what really this is taught. One commentator put it this way. Paul saw that when God designed the original marriage, he already had Christ and the church in mind. This is one of the great God purposes in marriage to picture the relationship of Christ in the church. And so, so marriage is that il illustrative uh, issue of God's great love for us in Christ. Is it possible to stay together in marriage? It is. Do all marriages succeed? No. In this room, we've got illustrations uh, across the board. Is there grace for marriage? Yeah, of course. How, is, how does it work? We're going to talk about next week. Uh, something very important uh, in this. If, 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 if the, the whole reality is that marriage is illustrative of Christ's deep, sacrificial love for the church, then love seems to be the core. And we want to talk about very practical means about how love really can energize our marriage. We're going to talk about the 10 deposits that we need to make in our wives' emotional bank account. Um, and, and, and we're going to talk illustratively about how love, how we can practice that and work that out in, in marriage. So that'll be a good time. We're going to laugh uh, and we're going to grow, but we're going to see uh, the reality of, of, of how love needs to be applied. For Christians, what is marriage? It's the union of two people. Saved by grace, ideally. Dependent upon Christ for his unconditional love. Who then are able to give that love to one another. Over the long haul. Illustrating Christ's great love for the church. Is this easy? No. Do we men need each other in the process of trying to build long lasting marriages? Do we need each other when we fail in marriage? Do we feel when do we need each other when we feel like we're failing in marriage? We need each other. And the reality, of the, the benefit of a group like this is not that we have it all together, that we've all been wonderfully successful in that, but by the grace of God, we understand what we're supposed to be doing in marriage. And by the grace of God, we can encourage each other in going in the same direction. To love our wives. Christ loved the church. And you got about 25 minutes. I'll bet you there's going to be some dynamite conversation around the table. But what I want you to do around the table today is to make sure that, that if you have, if you're struggling in marriage, don't hold it back from guys that could help you. At minimum, say, would you guys pray for me? And those of you guys who are doing well in marriage, don't act like you've got it all together because we know better. <laughs> we need each other. Let's talk about it, then we'll wrap it up together. Don't forget our website. Forge Truth. You know, the guys behind uh, the computers have really helped us understand the difference between a men and women. You guys are so simple. <laughs> women are so complex. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true, isn't it? Yeah. No. These guys over here are going to... You're going to stay another 30 minutes. 
Uh, how many of you unearth issues that still need to be worked on? It's not going to get solved overnight. Nothing gets solved overnight. My friend Pat Adams, who was here today, he asked me this question. He said, you know what happens when you combine PMS and GPS? <laughs> I said, no, but I'm going to be in trouble on this one. He goes, you get an angry woman who will find you. <laughs> That may be repeated um, <laughs> sometime. We're a grace ministry, for crying out loud. We got to laugh at ourselves, but we always got to remember that the gospel is the beginning, the, the, the midpoint, and the ending of everything we do. That by grace we've been saved through faith and not, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And we need grace for forgiveness so that we can move into our marriages continually, even when we fail to continue to move ahead in life. Uh, and, and God is good. I love, uh, I've, been, I've been just finishing the book, The Warrior's Heart by Eric Greitens. And um, Eric is a former Navy SEAL Rhodes Scholar. Um, we're trying to actually put together a forge event with him in Missouri. He's running for the governor uh, of Missouri. Uh, I, uh, I said, Eric, wouldn't you like to come speak with me? Uh, together we could do an event. And I know hundreds will come to hear you. <laughs> and, uh, but we're strategizing on something like that for maybe July. You could pray about that. He's not a Christian, but he's a powerful guy. He says a lot of wonderful things. When he, was, uh, when he was in Navy SEAL training, one of his officers said as they ran along the beach where there were a lot of women... And the officer noticed all of the trainees looking at the ladies. He said, he said, you know, if you're a real frogman, then every time a woman leaves your side, she'll feel better about herself. And I like that. That there are still some guys who understand that character creates relationships, respect. And that grace is what creates that character. Isn't it a wonderful thing that today we can go out there and because we're the sons of the Most High God, by grace we can be forgiven and by grace we can become great in our character as he defines greatness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that you love us as your boys, your sons, your men. Continue to develop us today. Continue to build in us that grace energized character of godliness. That we could be the men that we really want to be that can be used by you to impact this world that desperately needs you and needs to see a model of you in us. So be with my friends. Be with my brothers. Be with the rest of us boys today as we go out there and serve you as we pray in your strong name Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right guys have a great day.